Welcome to this evening's meeting hosted by Disabled People Against Cuts entitled Universal Basic Income, Solution or Illusion. My name is Ellen Clifford and I'm a member of the Disabled, uh, Disabled People Against Cuts, DPAC's National Steering Group. I'll be chairing the first half of tonight's meeting before handing over to the awesome Mandy Colloran for the second half. Between now and approximately 7.20, we're going to hear a range of views on UBI, both for and against. We'll then have about a 20 minute access break before coming back for the second half, when we'll hear about some of the pilots that have been taking place around the world. If you have any questions or comments on the discussion tonight, please use the comments section of whatever platform you're using to view the meeting. And we'll try to pick up as many of these as possible um, as time allows in the discussion sections at the end of each half. Before I hand over to the speakers, I'm just gonna give a very brief explanation of what Universal Basic Income, UBI, is. UBI is also known as a citizen's income or basic income. Essentially, all of these terms refer to the idea of a regular cash payment made to individuals without means testing or conditionality. So that means it's paid regardless of how much money you already have uh, coming in, and it's not tied to any requirement to be in or looking for work. Support for UBI has grown over the past decade in response to the harmful impacts of Tory welfare reforms. The economic and financial uncertainties created by the COVID-19 pandemic and the government's terrible mishandling of the situation have increased calls for a UBI. This is not something that DPAC as a campaign group officially support. And anyone interested in our views can find them online on the DPAC website in a report also called Universal Basic Income Solution or Illusion. These ideas are also laid out in more detail in the article, Universal Basic Income, Reasons to be Cheerful or No Go Central. We do, a, do love our Ian Jury at DPAC. Uh, which can be found in issue 165 of the International Socialism Journal, co-authored by myself and Mark Dunk, who will be speaking in the second half of the meeting. DPAC members have, however, consistently encouraged a debate on this subject, and they are absolutely right to have done so. And two of those who, who pushed for the debate, Mandy Hudson and Simone Aspis, are speaking tonight to give us their views. We may well all come out of this meeting still holding a complete mixture of different views on the subject, but we hope that the debate will provide useful additional information and viewpoints and help clarify thinking on the issues. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker for this evening, Paul Collins, who is Vice Chair and Equalities Officer of Henley Constituency Labour Party. So over to you, Paul. Can you hear me okay? Um, hello everyone. Um, personally, I can understand uh, in the short term why a UBI would be attractive. Um, uh, certainly in the case of COVID-19, but I would prefer it if they were considered separate emergency payments as opposed to a UBI. Um, in the long term, I'm against a, a UBI for the following reasons. One, you know, I believe that um, a UBI in the long term would actually uh, make it harder for um, um, employees and their trade unions to negotiate increases in pay for their workforce. In fact, um, I would even go as far as to say it could actually end up leading to decreases in wages. Um, I find it quite strange that nobody, and uh, lots of people on the left, haven't considered the fact that if everyone's getting a UBI, um, why wouldn't employers then make adjustments accordingly to their, to their wages? And, um, you know, and um, I mean, think about this for a moment. Um, most people are familiar with the uh, tax credits. And the thing to think about is, is it a real, is it a subsidy for their employer or is it a 
is it a subsidy for the employee or in fact a subsidy for the company that they work for? I also argue that um, a EBR is a private green for those, for some on the right. Uh, why is that? Well, it would provide, in theory, further opportunity continu to continue to cut public services pre privatization And of course, since everybody getting a EBI, the argument then would go that uh, people would then be able to pay for their own services individually. Remember, yeah, companies only like individual freedom when it means that you're paying for their services. Um, a UBI um, also wouldn't take into account if it's taken as one payment, as the introduction suggests, um, it wouldn't take into account the cost of living with a long-term illness or disability. Since the whole point of the a UBI is to fold the administration and to give everyone that one single payment, which is basically uh, universal credit. Um, the only difference is being that universal credit is for the whole household as opposed to one individual. That is literally the only difference. Um, and um, and uh, I will go back to say that uh, for many of us on the left, the attraction of the UBI is clearly attractive at first glance. The idea being that it might allow some to have a better work-life balance. I work fewer days a week. I take up painting, maybe write some bad poetry, for instance. Um, and of course, not having to go through the inhumane experience of applying for benefits. However, if anyone doubts what I've already said, if the UBI is such a good thing, uh, it should be noticed that those in favour include organisations such as the World Bank, the Adam Mitt Institute, Richard Benson, Elon Musk, etc. of all expressed an interest in the idea, why would that be? Can't be that their heart bleeds for the poor. Um, so the, what's the longer term solution? Well, I would say it was four things. Uh, sure to be able to throw capitalism altogether. Uh, um, one would be uh, an increase in nationalizations. Um, the other increased unionization um, in the workforce. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, the, and then uh, the third would be more cooperative employee-owned organizations, meat et cetera. Um, and the final, I, I believe that there should be a shift in taxation from earned income to that of unearned income, i.e. that of the, from private land ownership. The idea, i.e. land value tax, the idea being that um, land is created by nature, but the, but the economic value of land created by the community and therefore the, the people that privately own the land could therefore be paying a locational value on the, the land that they own. Um, and um, yeah, so, and so in conclusion, um, I would argue that without a, a fundamental shift in the way that society is currently organised, I would argue quite strongly that all a UBI would do would just get swallowed up by everybody's existing cost. Um, 
and I was finished off by saying thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Paul, for that. So our next speaker is Ellen Morrison, who is a leading member of DPAC, a trade unionist with Unite the Union and a Labour Party activist. Over to you, other Ellen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Morrison. I'm a DPAC member. I'm chair of Unite's London and Eastern Young Members Committee and I'm disability officer for my CLP. I've been part of the Scrap Universal Credit campaign, initially helping to, tra to change my trade union's policy to scrap two years ago, and then successfully getting Labour's policy to change on it too. I'm someone who relies on social security to help me get by. Despite previously being on the higher rate of employment support allowance, I'm now under universal credit, not eligible for any income replacement because my partner is in full-term employment. I'm doing my best to manage finding bits of paid work around struggling to access healthcare and the support I need to function. I mostly live off personal independence payment, PIP, which should be used to cover the additional costs of being disabled. But like many people, I use it to go towards my rent. So as both an activist and someone who has a personal interest in seeing social security overhauled so it's fit for purpose, do I think UBI is the solution? No. What I often think when I talk to people who are like me, either disabled or they, their partner or a relative is living on benefits, who think UBI could be the way forward, is that we do tend to agree on more than we disagree on. And those main areas tend to be, one, we need to redesign our system so we can live independently with dignity and with a decent amount to meet the cost of living. Two, conditionality, which is the criteria that makes you eligible for benefits and the actions you have to take to continue to receive them. Most of us are in agreement and end conditionality would be one of the first things we would change. And three, our current system is brutal and fundamentally broken. I think we can come together in agreement on those main areas, but without asking for a UBI. And I will go into some detail on why I don't think it's the solution we're looking for. But there's a lot to talk about when it comes to UBI, so I will try and focus on why I don't think it's the solution for disabled people. I also want to make the point that UBI is referred to as one thing, but it's not. The numerous trials around the world are all quite different, and this is the difficulty in focusing on an ask that is abstract, entirely based on principles and not tethered to any kind of reference point, like the cost of living in the particular place you're referring to, or the pre-existing social security system there, if there is one. I would encourage anyone to read Deepak's um, proposal position statement on UBI if you want an overview of some of these trials. When COVID hit, I reconsidered my position on UBI. With millions more now claiming universal credit, let alone the unknown numbers who weren't even eligible, people have been increasingly lo looking towards UBI as a potential solution in what looks to be a major economic downturn. It can seem like a simple and straightforward answer to providing people with financial support quickly and with ease. Unfortunately, social security systems aren't easy. You can't simplify social security into one ask and expect a decent system that provides security for everyone. Social security needs detail, nuance, and the understanding that you're trying to find solutions that will impact every group in society. And that lack of detail from UBI's proponents that enables it to appeal to both the political left and the right is one of the reasons I remain concerned that it would lead to further harm. When you get into the reality of what implementing UBI would look like, you realize that it isn't the simple radical idea that it's sold as. One of the main supporters of a basic income in the UK, Citizens Trust, openly admits that it doesn't provide a solution to meeting housing or disability benefits and they would, they would have to remain outside a model of UBI. And so there's a huge risk there that some of the groups that have been most affected by the cutbacks to our social security system over the past decade would be the people who are least likely to be helped by a basic income. Why wouldn't we prioritize efforts to ensure disabled people are at least offered the social protection they were afforded a decade ago? It's unacceptable to continue to ignore the largest minority group, disabled people, 
who, wake up, who make up nearly a quarter of our population. And it only confuses me when people say a universal basic income will lead to a destigmatization of benefit claimants, if everyone gets it. If disabled people's benefits remain separate to everyone else's, isn't that potential for a greater stigmatization? The think tank Compass did simulations for what a full UBI would look like in the UK. They found UBI to be insufficient for people who find themselves out of work for long periods of time. Disabled people are more likely to find themselves out of work for an extended period of time. 10% of disabled people have been out of work for more than five years compared to 3% of non-disabled people. The simulations of a full UBI also found that it wouldn't be feasible because of the negative impact on the poorest households. It's worth mentioning that this think tank, Compass, is in favour of UBI, that they think a part UBI model should be used, where you keep some of the existing benefit system and have a partial UBI for some groups. Compass and other organisations haven't made it clear what rates of benefits disabled people should be on. If you're advocating for UBI, just remember that disabled people have largely been excluded from modelling. Even more worrying are the implications for disabled people are the other implications for disabled people, sorry. To quote Guy Standing, one of the UK's most well-known proponents of UBI, basic income can be seen, as a, be seen as a means of inducing people to spend more time doing care work. A basic income would enable pe more people to spend more time in caring for those they love, thereby incidentally reducing pressure on the treasury to pay for public and private carers. In considering the net cost of a basic income, this expected saving should be factored into the calculations. Disabled people don't need a system that leads to a further lack of independence for us. We should never have to be reliant on family to provide the basic support we need. Not only would this negatively impact us, but also the workers who are paid to do the work. I think most people looking for social security systems are looking for less unpaid labour and more freedom. A far more progressive solution to the growing care crisis is the National Independent Living Service, backed by both the TUC and the UK Alliance of Disabled People and their organisations, Reclaiming Our Futures Alliance. Professor Standing is one of the leading figures in the UBI movement, not just in the UK, but he has been central to UBI trial across the world. As the co-founder of the Basic Income Earth Network, which started in the 1980s, he has been the centre of debate especially on the left and in the labour movement. Separate to the quote I just read, he's on record using disablest language and rhetoric. It's worth considering that for an issue that could so greatly impact disabled people, someone who advises on and informs trials and policy making is a professor whose words only feeds the othering of us. But on a positive note, I'd like to point to some people we could listen to in shaping social security policy. The Commission on Social Security will be putting out their initial proposals in the next month. The Commission is made up entirely of people who are currently or recently have been on benefits. Over the past two years, they've widely consulted with benefit claimants, disabled people and user-led groups. This model of trusting experts by experience is something progressive. It's seen as radical, but it shouldn't be. We've had decades of people who aren't on benefits designing, designing systems they will never have to use. So to conclude, why take a gamble on something that doesn't have any worked example of how it will support the world's largest minority? Is that the price we're willing to pay for no eligibility requirement? For the people on the left who think it has the potential to liberate us, could it be good to have freedom from wage labor and more time with our loved ones and doing the things we enjoy? Absolutely. Does UBI guarantee this? Not at all. It guarantees a basic amount of money to any citizen. And the key word there is basic. Advocates of a UBI are calling for something that isn't tied to any kind of reference to what the bare minimum is you would need to live with ease and dignity in the place in question. In reality, a basic income is likely to further entrench the inequality in society. For richer people, they will have money they can add to their savings. For poorer people, there's no guarantee it will cover their food and rent. In the UK, a monthly basic income amount that would cost the same as existing benefits and tax-free allowances would pay £230, yet the poverty line for a single person 
is £702 per month. I don't want to campaign for something where there'll be winners and losers. Instead, I think our efforts are best placed fighting for a social security system that works, for an end to sanctions and conditionality, and for a system that places trust in people who know and understand their lived experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ellen. So our next, next speaker, who will be speaking in favour of UBI, is Simone Aspis, who's a veteran disabled campaigner. Over to you, Simone. So, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but not see you. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, Okay, um, hi, my name is Simone Aspis. I am a disabled, um, I'm director of Changing Perspectives, three hour people, uh, now active uh, advocate and a People First and DPAC member. As I've only got eight minutes to speak, I will assume that everyone, that our comrades are fully aware of the, what is wrong with our social security benefit system. I am here to advocate for the universal basic income, citizens' income, which would replace our humane and punitive benefit system, which has left thousands of disabled people destitute and died. Citizens' basic income, what is it? It's unconditional. A citizen's basic income would, uh, would vary with age, but there would be no other conditions. So everyone of the same age would receive the same citizens' basic income whatever their gender, employment statement, family structure, contribution, uh, family structure, contribution to society, housing costs, or anything else. It would be automatic. Someone's citizen's basic income would be paid weekly or monthly automatically. No withdrawable. Citizen's basic income would not be means tested. If someone's earnings or wealth increase, then their citizen's basic income will not change. Individual citizen's basic income would be paid on an individual basis and not on the basis of a couple or household. As a right of citizenship, everybody legally a resident would be entitled to a, a citizen's basic income subject to a minimum period of legal residence in the UK and continuous residency for most of the year. Allowances um, additional allowances would be would would also be covered, including disability, housing, caring, and and childcare would be incorporated into an individual citizen's basic income. This is surely what we have argued for. Once a disabled person has been awarded a disability allowance, that money would not be generally withdrawn. It is worth noting that citizens' basic income would not cover any private purchase of services such as health and social care. For example, citizens would not pay for doctor's appointments and hospital visit, visits, children's school, schooling and the like. Further, allowances will not replace any necessary services which citizens may need regards to human support and advice. For instance, when it, whilst additional allowances may cover specific dietary products, nevertheless, individuals will still be able to benefit from the NHS dietitian and nutrition services free at the point of need. So if you need any assistance to be able to um, benefit from any allowances you have, you would still get that. There are two schools of thoughts around citizen's income as an alternative to providing so social, social safety services. This is the one that DPAC seems to advocate for, uh, well not advocate, which seems to be concerned about, I should say. Various UBI pilots, um, cited in DPAC's UBI solution where illusions involves the most disadvantaged and poorest communities. Like with any scheme targeting the poor, it's usually funded by replacing existing anti-poverty universal programs with, with more individualistic uh, solutions based initiatives. It is no surprise that UBI pilots have been used to replace existing employment support training programs, health and social care services, such as medical aid, diet supplements, food stamps, and the like. 
The level of allowance is often not set at a level that would allow for a decent standard of living, and therefore a question still needs to be asked whether amount constitutes a top-up grant rather than the UBA as we would understand it. The criticism about UBI is not about the concept itself, but how it is used by others with different agenda to us. Deepak's criticism about the UBI is very similar to the ones about direct payments we already have, direct payments for community care. Direct payments have been used to privatise social, social care system, pushing responsibility of care from the state onto the individual direct payment user, where they are expected to perform the role of a CEO on an unpaid basis. Direct payments have meant lower wages and fewer employment um, rights. With the, role of, with the role out of direct payments, many public services as community centres, educational courses and leisure opportunities have closed, leaving us with few opportunities for community engagement. We all know that direct payments does not equal independent living. Furthermore, I have yet to hear disabled people say, let's get rid of direct payments, but rather retain it. Surely it's very similar to the social model of disability. We all know how neoliberals have distorted ideas. This, is no, this, this does not mean that we didn't ditch the idea, i.e. social model and the direct payments. The Citizens Income Trust sees citizens' income as part of a package that aims to deliver universal social, social safety net. Let me say that again, direct that, that citizen income is seen as one element of our welfare system, not to replace it. A social safety net of public services such as the NHS, National Inclusive Education Service, and the National Independent Living Service must exist in a civilised society alongside citizens' income. No, again, no replacement. Inclusive infrastructures require state intervention, such as developing inclusive transport, education, policing, housing and environmental solutions. It cannot be achieved by using individualistic purchasing power. We understand that. We get that. We also think that we also think this is a good this, this all, We also believe that there is an opportunity to improve on on our labour uh, legislation and ensure that whatever rights people do have in employment still are retained. And given you have a direct, given you have a citizen's income, you are in better position and in a better bargaining power to enable that to enable that to happen. As long as you still got the labour laws in place. YouGov found that majority of the public support paying people a universal basic income to ensure their financial security, introducing a jobs guarantee to keep employment stable and bringing in rent controls to limit housing costs. A, service, a survey found the following, 77% adults in support of UBI, 53% agree to higher taxes to fund UBI at a decent level beyond bare minimum. 66% agreed that companies benefiting from artificial intelligence advancement should, uh, should pay more tax. UBI allows disabled, allows disabled like their non-disabled fellow citizens have a minimum income that they could do whatever they want with it. But this would allow disabled persons greater autonomy over their lives without fear of engaging in work or specific activities and being told by the state that they are fit for work. Yes, UBI requires a massive overhaul of how the state and society views our social security net, one that is enabling rather than punitive. UBI levels is a political choice. So Mo, Since, you start winding up now, please. I am, I'm on my last paragraph. Since oh. the 19 outbreak, I mean, uh, UBI is a political choice. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, it's expected that the government would have spent 298 billion just for this financial year. So therefore, so therefore can choose to implement a fully UBI, UBI scheme at a standard which ensures every single human being is able to live with dignity. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for that, Simone. Our next speaker is Mandy Hudson, who is a teacher, a member of the National Education Union and a disability rights activist based in Ealing. Over to you, Mandy. And then after Mandy, we'll be hearing from Grace. Apologies, Grace, we're running a little late. Hello, well, thank you very much for having me this evening. I'd just like to explain a little bit about you know, where I come from in relation to UBI. Um, I was um, a member of a TUC Disabled Workers Research Group um, back in about 2017. And, um, and as, as, the, um, as the information for this meeting said, that UBI was approved by the TUC back in 2019. And yet, uh, and yet it's, it's clearly unpopular in, in, many, in many respects. I'm no expert. I've done some reading and I've, I've, I've had some thoughts about UBI and I'd like to share why I think overall I'm in favour tonight. Okay. I do acknowledge the people's concerns about the neo neoliberal agenda, particularly the, the way that the IMF seems to want to use UBI and also how it may not seem to, to be something that will contribute fully to the independent living of disabled people. And also just the economic practicalities, i.e. How, how can a society afford it? But I still think that it represents a way forward for all. So why is UBI a good thing? As people have already noted this evening, the current benefit system is punitive. It's looking for excuses not to support people. Whereas as um, Simone's just outlined, a sort of citizen's income do, would, look to support all its citizens fairly. I think it shows that people are of intrinsic value in terms of just, just being themselves rather than their ability to produce for, 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 for others. And I think that that's something that as disabled people we, we find in, in our day-to-day -day lives that when we're not valued for ourselves, but if we're considered to be unproductive by some, then we then we tend to be just put to one side. And I think that universal basic income is a way that that people can be valued just for themselves without having to, to sort of work for it, as it were. Like like others on the on on this Zoom tonight, it was personal experience that made me long for something different. In my case, it was the the swap from DLA to PIP and uh, at the same time was being reassessed by my local council for, um, for, for social care package, which made me think that there must, be, there must be something else. And so that's really sort of where I began looking at, looking at, 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 at UBI. And I, and I think it, for me, what it does is it, it, it makes it so that you, you don't have to strive, that, that sense of unconditionality that people have talked about tonight already. And I think too, um, it would be something that was genuinely needs led. Now there's, there's lots of talk about universal basic um, income just, just being, being sort of not enough for disabled people. But as Simone has said, it needs to be seen alongside that National Independent Living Support Service and, and other, other aspects of Free, um, free access to fully access, um, fully mainstream education and access to healthcare as well. So it needs to be seen alongside that. Everybody needs income. Uh, the, the, one, of, one of the pilots that happened was it was in India, and people seem to dismiss that because it because it you know it, the UK situation is so different from from some of the, the circumstances in India. But I think that that pilot did prove that it can improve the lives of those who, who had nothing. Now, I know we can't necessarily compare ourselves to, to India in terms of the vast difference between rich and poor in this country. But I think at times, unfortunately, we're getting there in terms of poverty. So I think it's a universal basic income is that safety net for, for the very poorest in our society. So that's some of the reasons why I think that it's a good thing. In terms of some obstacles to that, I think that some people do feel that the welfare state is threatened. 
but I don't think that UBI is a threat. I mean, if we if we look at the systematic dismantling of the NHS that's been going on for years, the fact that even now most of our national health service is privatised, we've still got that fight on our hands. It's not it's not necessarily going to be take to to be dismantled by by UBI. So I, so I think that that it's important to realise that that it you know that it's that we don't need to to dismantle the welfare state whilst getting a citizen's in, income i i think i think the way that um bosses use um use ubi as an excuse to to lower wages needs to be resisted bosses will try and do anything really um in terms of, to just make sure that they don't have to pay for anything and I think what happens sometimes is that poor get held to ransom if they if they have been given UBI. But we need to we need to work against that. So I think that UBI is a is a solution if individuals are supported appropriately. And in the end, I think it needs to be funded by the rich. I, I was thinking about um, where where I where I sit on in terms of 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 where economically we would find the money. And I think that we do need a complete restructuring of our tax system so that the, the rich are unable to, to escape their, their portion. I, th I think that UBI would mean that disabled people are valued more in, just for themselves rather than for what, what they can do, as it were, in, in other people's view. And I think that it's a society which is built, built on genuinely shared values so that people's needs are recognized rather than fought for you know we are, we are used to the constant struggle for our rights but i think that we are we the reason why we struggle for those rights is because we believe that a society is possible where where we can share values and and truly support one another and how we get there um, our first speaker talked about the need to destroy capitalism so that's a very simple ask for us tonight, isn't it? And also the cooperative experience. Paul mentioned that. I mean, I'm I'm currently involved in a in a care cooperative that's just trying to get off the ground in in Ealing, and and I think that that that's a way forward for how people can can act locally, but with with a national system behind them. We need to continue to campaign for social justice. Have that full access to education for all, a fully inclusive edu education system, a fair tax system, which I've already mentioned, and, and good access to healthcare. So I think UBI is about raising up rather than levelling down. And I think we do need to fight for that. So that's what I'm saying to you tonight. And I can see Ellen's face has come on, so I shall stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandy, for that. Thank you. So our final speaker in this half of the meeting is an ally of DPAT, Grace Blakely, who's an economics and pol politics commentator, columnist, journalist, author, and Labour Party activist. Over to you, Grace. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I've been having a bit of trouble with my internet today. Um, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit... Uh, unstable. I'm going to try and, and, and just get through and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear me again. Um, so thank you so much to all, to all the other uh, panellists and thank you uh, to Deepak for inviting me to this and to Ellen for organising and hosting. Um, I am very excited to read Ellen's new book which uh, I've heard is excellent though I haven't had a chance to read it but judging from her previous output it's, uh, it's brilliant. So today I really want to talk about the impact of uh, universal basic income on the process of decommodification or commodification of the means of, sub of subsistence. Now, this is kind of a concept that comes from a lot of Marxist thinking. And it's effectively that um, there is there are a certain kind of pool of goods and services that workers need to survive that are needed to kind of reproduce human beings. Uh, so from housing to food to healthcare to, you know, probably a more expanded list of things that we would describe as kind of necessary for people to exist, including things like transport, um, broadband even, which uh, is clearly very important at the moment. 
Um, and uh, the question as to whether or not these things should be subject to the market mechanism. Now, advocates of the idea that uh, the means of subsistence should be decommodified suggest that these are not goods and services that should really be subject to the market mechanism at all. Now, of course, this links in with broader kind of socialist and Marxist thinking that suggests that the impact of the market mechanism in general should be very, very limited. But even when you're thinking about, you know, social democracy and social democratic um, institutions rather than purely socialist ones, there is a very strong case for saying that these goods and services in particular should not be subject to prices. They shouldn't be allocated uh, through the market. Instead, they should be provided to everyone free at the point of use. Now, that happens to be my position. Um, I think it is really very important uh, and should be a really important cause of struggle for the left to say that actually there are certain things that all human beings need to survive and these things should be free. Now, the issue I have with universal basic income, one of the issues I have, and the one that I talk about most frequently, um, because it is not something that I think is, is discussed, is the issue that it has, is the impact, sorry, that it has on um, on versus decommodification. Um, so you can imagine that there's a very different relationship that's created between um, uh, an individual and, uh, and the state um, by a system which uh, gives out money, gives income in the form of money, in the form of cash uh, to individuals as a UBI would, as compared to a system where the means of subsistence and the um, the entities that are used to produce the means of subsistence are commonly owned and provided free at the point of use. In one system, you're given a pot of money, uh, however big or small that amount of money may be, and you're told, go out and spend this money on the things that you need to survive. If you spend it poorly, if uh, you know your needs are higher than someone else's then that's just too bad you know this is your money you go you know do with it what you want go and decide what you would like to purchase out of the array of goods that you can find on the market it's up to you we're not going to say or do anything about that that's a very different kind of subjectivity than the one that's created um, when you say transport healthcare, food production these are things that are um, run by the public sector. They are therefore owned collectively by everyone in society. You know, we are completely and utterly um, responsible for these services and they therefore um, should be, you know, should be able to provide us with the things that we need to survive for free. Um, it's a very different subjectivity that's created. Uh, and I think it's one that's more conducive to, um, the kinds of relationships that we would be seeking to build under socialism. Um, because, you know, a, a key, I think a critical part of the kind of ideology that underpins neoliberalism and underpins modern capitalism is to see individuals as kind of atomized um, units kind of bumping up against one another in a, in a free market rather than as part of a community and as part of a community where people have um, responsibilities to one another um, and where they are in turn owed a certain amount just by virtue of being part of that community. Now, I think universal basic income potentially could actually reinforce that kind of individualization um, and commodification of human beings that is associated with uh, with neoliberalism because yes everyone gets this pot of money that they can use to buy whatever they want but it is still a pot of money and the things that you need to survive are still subject to the market mechanism they still have prices and if for one reason or another your income in a month goes quicker than it otherwise might do you're still you know um, at the whim of the market in terms of your ability to survive and to feed yourself whereas if we adopted a model of say you know what's often called universal basic services which is effectively just extending the model of the nhs to everything that the human beings need to survive to all the means of subsistence um, is uh you know effectively um 
from everything from healthcare where this system already applies through to social care um, through to transport as i said through to um even food for example the idea of a national food service is i think something that's very interesting and has increasingly taken off over the course of the pandemic then you start to i think generate a much more communitarian and arguably socialist subjectivity where people see that these are things that you know we own in common collectively our transport infrastructure our food infrastructure um, our welfare infrastructure our health infrastructure we own these things in common we run them together because of course along with that uh, case for public ownership there would also be a very strong case for democratic planning and accountability of those services um, and we are able to use them to the extent that we need them rather than to the extent that we're able to pay for them so i do think there is there is this trade-off that we have to choose between whether it's universal basic income give everyone a pot of money or provide everyone with the things that they need to survive free at the point of use and i think that the second option gets us much further away from the um, individualizing, commodifying, oppressive and exploitative logics of modern capitalism, it gets us much closer to the um, kind of ideals of democratic socialism, which is you know, based on this idea of, uh, well, I suppose each according to his ability to each according to, to his need, right? That we are part of this community. Um, and we all have, you know, we all put in, we all take out in as much as uh, as we need that. Um, and I think uh, there's another point that I, I kind of mentioned briefly there that I think is really important and that I'd like to pick up on as well, which is um, the importance of de democracy and of democratic planning in governing how these services would work. Because again, you know, another issue with universal basic income is that you are handed this pot of money but the kind of mechanisms, the democratic mechanisms that link you and the state that is handing you that money are often quite weak. A lot of people feel quite excluded from the democratic process. Indeed, a lot of people are excluded from the democratic process. Whereas I think a model of universal basic services would allow people to engage in uh, democratic planning of the services that they are using and allow, for example, communities to come together, work with local authorities, work with union organisations and the labour movement in order to say these are our priorities for service provision. This is what we want to see from our services. Uh, and this is how I think we should, we should go forward in terms of developing a, a local community plan. So for me, when it comes to you know, these issues of commodification, of, of democracy, of voice within the system, really, which is, I think, what it comes down to, I, I argue that this model of universal basic services is preferable to the model of universal basic income. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for listening to me. I hope that you can all hear me. And I've just seen that as I've been gesticulating, you can see my fingers, <laughs> which are severely injured from a, a wound inflicted by cutting an avocado. <laughs> which is very embarrassing. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Um, if it's all right with everyone, we've had uh, some comments and, and questions come in. I'm just going to put one very quick question, if speakers uh, could, could come to it and speak quite quickly with your answer. Um, so the question has come from Sophie Talbot, and she wants each of the panellists to say, what is your preferred model of a UBI? So I'm going to start with Simone. Am I unmuted? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my Very quick. <laughs> preferred model is one that advocated for both universal services and in, and individual income because the combination of the two. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Simone. Paul. Um. Um, I, I don't mind the idea of universal services, but certainly one that does, um, that is obviously one that's basic, but also one that can take into account individual circumstances alongside that as well. But without that, um, that second element, um, I don't think a UBI would succeed. So the second version, the, the second bit that takes individual circumstances into account 
uh, alongside the basic UBI is absolutely vital. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mandy next, and then we'll have Grace and finish with Ellen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that in the end, the National Independent Living Support Service is is a, is the key key way for disabled people to to be able to live out independent lives. But I do think that universal basic income has got a part to play in that as well, because it gives it gives everybody then a, a chance to actually have some money of their own. Brilliant. Thank you, Mandy. Grace? Sorry, could I be really annoying and ask uh, to repeat the question yeah, because my fine. audio cut out? <laughs> it was um, asking each of the panellists if you have a preferred model of UBI. Um, well, yeah, I mean, as I, as, I, as I kind of mentioned, I think I would prefer for that for the model to be rather than, you know, handing out individual pots of money to, to people to actually um, construct a system of demographically uh, only run services that were free for everyone at the point of use. Uh, one interesting model that I also think, you know, could be used alongside this um, is the idea of a, a kind of universal basic dividend. So as long as well as having um, everything that you need to, to live free at the point of use. So, you know, you're, you're always going to be able to have those things. Um, as a way of, of, of socialising ownership and providing people with uh, a top to their income, um, I think that there's a case for saying that the state should be a much bigger investor in a lot of things. And I think this is particularly important when you think about the, the need to transition towards a, a green economy. The state is going to have to do a lot more investing um, rather than doing that in a way that benefits private investors, do so in a way which um, allows for the kind of accumulation of public assets over the long run and out of which people can be paid a, a dividend, as it were, um, rather than just simply a universal basic income. And again, that comes from the perspective of basically saying that ultimately none of the things that we want to achieve, none of the emancipation, none of the kind of uh, exploitation, uh, certainly not um, a, a green economy will be achieved under the conditions of capitalism. Ultimately, we have to be able to construct an economy that works in the interests of working people and is run by, well, you know, I say working people, meaning everyone who uh, has to sell their labour power for a living. And that includes labour that is not uh, you know, what we would traditionally describe as labour. So whether that's, you know, applying for benefits, whether it's reproductive labour, whatever. Um, anyone who relies on their labour of whatever kind to survive um, has to be, like, in charge of our economic outcomes and in charge of the institutions that govern our society. Sorry, my the sun has just come out and it's shining very, very brightly on my face. I apologise and I will end that. Thanks, <laughs> Grace. And finally, Ellen. So um, I don't think I would say I have a preferred model of UBI. I think our priority should be campaigning for an end to sanctions and conditionality, uh, fighting for a living wage. And like Mandy said, um, for a national independent living support service. Uh, I would also like to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, that we should um, look out for the proposals that are coming from the Commission um, on Social Security in the coming month. Uh, I can't reveal what they are yet, but uh, I would highly recommend looking out for them. Brilliant. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers from the first half of that meeting. I think that was a really interesting debate. Thank the communication support. Um, and we're now going to have an access break until 7.40, when we'll be coming back and the wonderful Mandy Colleran will be taking over.